Hey everybody, this is Lindsay McKissick from the Backcountry Wilderness Area. Um, I'm here again with Anne from the Raptor Education Foundation for a special Memorial Day nature chat um, with her ambassador, her female bald eagle. So Anne, thanks so much for coming again. Thanks for having me, Lee. Good afternoon to everybody. I hope you guys had a wonderful Memorial Day week and, and took a few moments to pause and reflect upon the contributions and sacrifices of our veterans. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a former military wife. We have a lot of military ties in my, my family. And this year, I think just uh, thinking about the first responders, the firefighters, nurses, the doctors, the medics, the folks working at food banks, mm -hmm. everybody pulling together, it's sort of the unseen enemy is a good thing to add to uh, the Memorial Day acknowledgement. Agreed. Um, so as we start to get a few live listeners here, um, feel free to just uh, add questions in the comments on the Facebook page, and we will address those as they pop up. And otherwise, um, Anne, I'm going to let you take over and give us some information here about your ambassador. All right, um, I'm gonna adjust my screen just a little bit back. There we go, so we're not cutting off her head. <laughs> I've got tech support here because she's so big. So she has a very long story. We can talk about that in a little bit, but this is our female bald eagle. She has just turned five. She is originally from Wyoming and she was taken out of the wild illegally at an estimated age and kept for a few months is not truly imprinted to humans like our short-eared owl is but she is acclimated and cannot survive and hunt on her own so we have her since september of 2016 she weighs about 11 and three quarters pounds about 11 pounds 12 ounces she's gotten up to 12 and a half pounds and her wind is seven feet which i will show you in a little bit but because it's windy we're gonna wait for just a minute. Okay. Um, do you want to go ahead and just start with maybe her story, and then we can get into some other details? Sure, absolutely. So she came from the uh, Rollins, Wyoming area, and in July of 2015, she was found essentially at. Uh, Seminole Reservoir State Park, which is north of Ali between Rollins and Sinclair. And Wyoming Game and Fish got a call that there was a first bald eagle hanging around a campground and jumping up onto picnic tables and being fed from campers and fishermen. Wasn't afraid of people, was clearly starving and getting the So she was picked up by a Game and Fish warden and um, that area of Wyoming, I mean, Wyoming is so wild and beautiful anyway, but she has a, a jurisdictionary of 2,100 square miles. Wow. She has to deal with bears, with wolves, with bison getting out of the Yellowstone ecosystem. It's, as I say, you know, Wyoming's the real deal. It's still the Wild West there. Mm -hmm. So I tell you that she went into an unofficial rehab situation for about seven months because the raptor re have resources in that part of Wyoming very, very far between. And she was taken to a, a, a person that had worked with and rehabbed Eagle formally on the East Coast. Well, in early uh, 2017, um, she became a bit of a, you know, political football between U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Wyoming Game and Fish and what should be done with her. Some people said she was too used to people and it would not be a good time, a good uh, idea to release her. And other folks said, well, she hasn't had a chance to really socialize with her own kind and be in a proper young old eagle environment. We should give her that chance. So that's what happened. She was actually rehabbed here in Colorado. And then basically a year later, so now we're talking summer of, um, uh, wait, back up here. She went into the rehab in early 2016, summer of 2016. We're talking May and June. She was then released. Am I boring you? Yeah, big yawn. <laughs> and 
a few days later, she showed up in a warehouse in Sinclair. She was released very close to where she was discovered. And she was swooping down to grab gloves and equipment in the warehouse, wasn't afraid of people. The warden pulled her out again, and this time released her further east beyond the park along the Platte River. Well, this time she was out for close to two weeks, and when she appeared again, she was almost halfway down to Saratoga, Wyoming, sitting on a dude ranch. And she wasn't afraid of the cattle, the dogs, the horses, people, and she was injured, a bunch of cuts and you know scratches here on her wrist, and she was also down to a seven and a quarter pound. She was starving. So it's just been very clearly proven that this eagle does not know how to scavenge or even steal food from other raptors and predators, which is what bald eagles tend to do, especially a lot during their first three years or so. So uh, we were finally allowed to acquire her in, uh, as I said, September of 2016, when she was 18 months old at that point. We estimate she hatched in April because Wyoming bald eagles are on pretty much the same hatching and nesting schedule as Colorado ones. Um, what is her personality now that you've had her for a while? Um, it's very interesting. Initially, she was scared because she had had a very up and down relationship with people. Um, from what, now she's being curious, from what we were told about from the warden who knew the Rollins area, the nest was up on a tree only about 25 feet. I'm guessing based on her behavior and a lot of consultation with the Minnesota Raptor Center or the Raptor Center at the University of Minnesota, that she is what we call habituated. At first, you know, people stole her out of the nest and then they dumped her, but then she needed to go. We were yeah. trying to uh, acclimate her again. So the first couple of years, she was pretty calm. She would get hungry easily though with temperature changes i mean we feed her a lot of food every day it's interesting whenever the temperature would drop it's like she was almost remembering those days from being hungry now that she's five years old and effectively sexually to her um she's a little bit sassy that's actually better for the screen She's actually a little bit sassy. She tries to intimidate people. She will be very vocal and greet, yell at strangers. Um, bald eagles are much more social than goldens. Mm -hmm. And because she's sort of essentially grown up around people and we've had her now for three and a half years, she's very confident, I guess is how I would mm -hmm. describe her. Um, so kind of maybe go right off what you just said. Um, our very first broadcast, we had your golden eagle on, and, and people in Highlands Ranch are familiar with our talks about the golden eagle nest. Can you tell us how the bald and the golden eagle are different? Yeah, they are just about as different as night and day, okay? They're both eagles, and in this country, eagles means large. That is not always the case around the world. Depending on who you talk to, there are somewhere around 65 to 70 species of eagles. Many of the eagles in tropical areas closer to the aquari uh, the equator are not much bigger than the standard red-tailed hawk. So in the U.S. we think of an eagle as a large bird, but that's not always the case. Golden eagles and bald eagles are in different genera, so the scientific name is genus and species. The bald eagle is Haliaetus leucocephalus, and Haliaetus means potty, Greek sea eagle. Mm -hmm or is Greek forced eagle, I should say, and leucocephalus is white head. Leuco being white, cephalus, cephalus, head. So the sea eagles have feathers that end somewhere around the, the heel joint. They don't have feathers all the way down to the tops of the feet the way a golden would. It's a little bit hard to see on the camera, but this is because they are fishermen. Now this doesn't mean that all she eats is fish, but all uh, eight species of sea eagles hunt fish in one form or another. The cool thing about the bald eagle is that they are found only in North America, from Alaska down to the Rio Grande, that's fine, Peter, the Rio Grande um, Valley. And occasionally a bald eagle will, of course, wander over into Mexico, but um, they are sort of uniquely a North American bird. 
And here in Colorado, our bald eagles also specialize in prairie dogs, cottontail rabbits, mm -hmm. Canada geese, gulls, and waterfowl. Um, our guys are really good at catching geese on ice, frozen ponds, and prairie dogs when they need to during the nesting season because we simply don't have the large number of lakes that say Washington State or Minnesota has. Um, on average, both species are the same size, but bald eagles have smaller feet in proportion to their body size, but a larger beak. All of the sea eagles have this, this big beak mm -hmm. that is much larger in proportion to their head than it is on a golden eagle. Wow. So, so pretty. Um, talking a little bit about the, the physical attributes, um, what is the purpose of the, the white head? Is there a, a hunting or a camouflage or is there, a, or is it just how, how they are? You know, all of the species of sea eagles are patterned in shades of dark and white. Um, one of their close cousins, the African fish eagle, actually has a white head that extends all the way down to the neck, breast, and belly. And instead of being dark brown, the feathers are almost sort of a deep, deep rust. Um, there's the white-bellied sea eagle in Indonesia and Malaysia. They are white and gray. I suspect it has to do something with a sea environment. The other, probably the closest relative from an evolutionary standpoint to the bald eagle is the white-tailed eagle or the white-tailed sea eagle. And they are found in Northern Europe. Um, they have been reintroduced into Ireland um, they are still considered endangered, and there's now two populations on both the west and east coast of Scotland. If you see the white-tailed sea eagle, you can clearly see the common genetic ancestor with our bald. The white-tailed also has a white tail, but it's, it's diamond or wedge-shaped a little bit like a raven. Their heads are paler con uh, compared to their body, um, but it's not a true, true white head. But they also have light whitish yellow eyes and a yellow beak so honestly lindsay i'm guessing it has something to do with either um encountering salt water or being able to see through and catch fish and the light reflecting off the plumage that is my guess but i'm truly not sure, sure. why there is the white head and white tail but certainly in balds it signals sexual maturity it means they're ready to breed um what is there any difference in size or coloring between male and female bald eagles? Coloring, no size, yes. Um, bald eagles in the continental United States, the males are going to be around eh, seven to let's say nine pounds. The females are going to be about nine and a half, ten to thirteen. But there is um, the Alaskan bald eagle, and then there's the southern bald eagle, which is a different subspecies. The southern bald eagle is what breeds in Florida, and they are small. Mm. Male southern bald eagles can weigh as little as 5 pounds, 10 ounces. And because they're so much further south, they actually have eggs laid in December compared to our mm. eggs being laid, you know, February kind of, or, you know, early March uh, type uh, time frame. In Alaska, a big female bald eagle in Alaska can have an eight foot wingspan and weigh 15 pounds. Wow. That's a big bird. Yeah. Um, do, uh, with their eggs, how many um, eggs do they typically lay? So two to four, two to three is very common. And probably another major, major difference between bald eagles and golden eagles is there is less case of siblicide in the nest. They really don't heavily practice the cane able syndrome that we talked about in goldens, where the first chick often kills and consumes the second one. Mm -hmm. If there, we have experienced parents and um, there are, there's a good food supply, you know, maybe lake and ground mammals. It is absolutely very common for bald eagle parents to successfully fledge three young. Wow. 
That's amazing. Um, I'm just gonna I think she's actually looking at the camera. Oh, hey, buddy. <laughs> um, I just want to pause to reach out to anyone who's listening live that if you have any questions for Anne about um, her female golden eagle or, or I mean bald eagle or bald eagles in general, go ahead and type them in and we can um, put those out for Anne to look at. Um, it looks like here. Um, Phil has one. It appears the number of bald eagles in Colorado is rising. What can be done here in Highlands Ranch to help seeing those numbers continue to grow. Yeah, um, Phil does bring up a good point. Um, the number of bald eagles here in Colorado has just exploded. That's the right term. How about a drastic increase there we go. in the last 10 years? Um, the last breeding bird survey, which was completed uh, the last uh, data year was 2011, showed 148 nests. That was way back in 2011. I now know though, that there are over 200 active nests in Colorado and more appear all the time. Um, another big difference between bald eagles and golden eagles, bald eagles are very tolerant of human disturbance and human activity. They don't mind being around people too much. Now, obviously if you are walking around under the nest, and there's cars and cameras, that is not a conducive situation. But bald eagles will nest where goldens can't. And bald eagles love cottonwood trees. Some of the frustrating things for our raptor folks is that she's, again, you know we're at Bar Lake, so we have cormorants and swains and socks and herons flying all over the place here. Um, bald eagles seem to have this weird propensity to pick cottonwood trees that are dead or they will put their nest in the fork or the crotch of the tree where the branch is dead. So unfortunately it means that nests collapse or branches break off. I suspect it's probably because it's easier for them to get in and out and um, you know, just land and bring prey and the two work the nest together. But even though we don't have lakes and a lot of water, we have good habitat. So to answer Phil's question, um, there really isn't a lot of good bald eagle habitat in the back country. Um, there was a nesting attempt at Chatfield State Park on your very, very west side this year. Mm. Um, and there are new nests popping up near us here in Adams and Weld and Larimer County all the time. But being mammal hunters and eagles, the same food source that bald eagles and golden eagles will rely on is present in Highlands Ranch, prairie dogs and cottontail rabbits. Mm -hmm. And Lots of those. so, and you know, frankly, um, there are bald eagles hunting out at Cherry Creek State Park too. Um, I don't know if they had an active nest this year, but it wouldn't surprise me if they did. New nests pop up every year. So, um, obviously, our golden eagle nest is historic, used year and year and year in and out. Um, do bald eagles return yeah. to the same nesting site, or do they find something different every year? They do. They do return if conditions are right and something doesn't prompt them to build another nest nearby. And that happened actually near us here in Commerce City, the largest bird nest ever recorded of any species was a bald eagle nest. And I think it was measured at basically nine feet or three meters across, something like 14 feet deep because it kept on just being built on year after year after year after year. And finally the tree broke under its weight and it was a couple of tons. Mm. It was a huge, huge nest. So yes, um, building a bald eagle nest from scratch if a pair comes in and says, my goodness, well, candy is beautiful. And look at this nice stream and look at this beautiful tree. They need to start nest building in December. Wow. If they are going to have a nest big enough to support this big girl and dad and the baby come, you know, March. Right. Um, you know, I, I had seen, maybe it was your kind of coverage of a bald eagle nest recently, that there was three eagles tending to one nest up north. Is that a common thing or is it usually just mom and dad? 
It is usually mom and dad. It is not unknown though with bald eagles to have a different mating strategy or reproductive strategy. And we actually saw a tiny bit of some of this going on here in the Denver metro area with the Stanley Lake pair. Mm -hmm. So in the upper Mississippi River area, I believe the nest is technically in Illinois. There is the trio as they have called, um, I'm gonna lose track of time, but I'm thinking about two years ago, there was a female and a male raising a baby and they accepted a third bird, a male, in to help them bring food and provision the young. And then shortly after hatching, the female was killed in a territorial dispute with another male. And they have a camera on this nest, so they've been able to see everything that was going on. So the two surviving males successfully raised and fledged those two babies, I think it was that year. The following year, they managed to and recruit a new, slightly younger, wild female to, you know, alternative lifestyle, as we All call right. it. And they, I believe, are raising young now. And what happened with Stanley Lake this year is mom and dad were on the nest and then a wild floater female. That's the biological term for an adult bird reproductive age that for whatever reason is not paired. A wild female came in and drove the Stanley Lake mom. And eventually he sort of, you know, tolerated her by himself. The egg hatched. He had to get off and feed himself. It hatched the day before Sunday, Easter Sunday, it snowed. Unfortunately, the eaglet died in a couple of days. It was very sad, but here's kind of the really interesting thing. This type of weird middle of the breeding season intrusion and dispute, this is the kind of thing that goes on in the ecosystem, like in the greater Chesapeake Bay ecosystem in Virginia, in the Potomac River area where, where there are so many bald eagles now that they are literally running out of room and territories to nest and real estate, a female of good breeding age, a good nest. These are all things that males are now fighting over to the death. The fact that we see things like this now starting in Colorado means we have a ton of bald eagles. I mean, a ton. so that's the upside to the squabbles during the breeding season. Um, and actually there's a, a question here from Amy kind of off of that. Um, okay. What is the social life like for a bald eagle? Um, when you see multiple bald eagles together, are they competing with each other or working together? Um, it could be both. It depends on the age. When bald eagles leave the nest, they effectively spend the first two years of their life bullying each other, their peers, and their um, adults out of food. Unlike golden eagles that usually will stop scavenging on a regular basis by the time they're three or four year old, three or four years old, bald eagles scavenge their entire life. They would much rather rob an osprey or a sub-adult than kill something on their own. Mm -hmm. And this is another reason why in the winter we see so many bald eagles. We get somewhere around 1,500 bald eagles that come here to Colorado during the uh, winter months from about November, February, our peak. And they just hang out together, waiting for us to die or <laughs> somebody else to make a kill. <laughs> and they learn each other that way. A lot of times, depending on where in the country and depending on the ecosystem and the temperature and the food availability, a recently fledged eagle will disperse or migrate. It will look for a river or a water. The minute it sees an adult bald eagle, very easily recognized, of course, white-headed male, it will start shadowing it and just waiting for something to happen. Eagle at the uh, Rocky Mountain Wildlife Arsenal and Refuge, January, February is prime time because they will throw deer carcasses and other roadkill animals out there and bald eagles and golden eagles and red-tailed hawks and ravens of all age groups squabbling for food. And 
the vocalization, the calling, they are just more verbal and social than golden eagles tend to be. Okay. That's awesome. Um, we have another question from Brian. Um, obviously, we live in a spot where there's a lot of construction and growth. Um, do bald eagles adapt and put up with the disturbance or do they move on? It just how severe, how long, and how close. But if anybody is going to adapt, it's more to be a bald than a golden. Um, Peter travels to Seattle a lot, and right in the heart of Lake Washington, a very nice, busy area, area in Seattle, which is pretty dense. Go ahead and move it back just a little bit. There we go. There is the Broadmoor Golf Course, and there's the golf course and traffic and water traffic out in the <clears> lake. <throat> It is extremely busy. That pair does not care. And they're wow. raising three young again this year. I remember when my son was going to Lakewood High School, um, when before he could drive, <laughs> going up Kipling, seven in the morning, there would be a bald eagle sitting in the light post over Jewel almost yeah. every morning. Um, they have figured out too that prairie dogs, which are a good food source, tend to be pretty close to some of our suburban areas. Mm -hmm. So food and they have just um, adapted. Awesome. We have another question here from Josette. Let's see here. Um, what is on the menu for your uh, bald eagle? Well, that's kind of an end story for her because she was with people, I'm getting for about two to two and a half months. I will tell you right now, fish is not her food. When I had her at home, um, because of the manning and the intensive relationship that I needed to build with her, we got permission from the US Life Service for me to temporarily house her at my facility. I think I've mentioned this before. I have the most patiently in the world. I had a beautiful chunk of salmon from Whole Foods, an entire uh, fish head, and it's about the size of a eh, small ping pong ball. I popped it out and I could just see it in her face. She was like, what is this? The second piece I put in her mouth, she threw up. So what she really, really likes to eat are cottontail rabbits and jackrabbits. <laughs> oh, yeah. right? <laughs> I was hoping she'd do that. We call that the squeaky pig. That is a, 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 a territory, a, hey, what are you doing here? Or this is my spot. That's what that noise means. Oh. Her favorite food is rabbit. OK. Um, she loves duck. She loves geese. We feed her fish about once a week. And it looks like she puts it through a wood chipper. It's just shredded. Our male bald eagle, who is 30 this year, he loves fish. But he did not come into captive care with people until he was about 18 months old. So he had eaten them in the wild. And yeah, we feed her fish once a week. No one else here will eat it. We have other eagles and critters that need the rat and the ducks as well. But I will tell you, it's not her favorite but that's because of he was raised. Obviously she is a sea eagle. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, a question for, from me is, um, you know, we had started to kind of talk about the uh, population growth in Colorado. How many do you balds live in, in Colorado full time? They, or do they migrate around? Um, I am going to guess that the vast, vast majority of our breeding pairs are year-round residents. And we don't need to leave, or they don't need to leave. Part of the reason why we get so many migrants, the um, majority of those 1,500 that migrate come up here, uh, come down here from Alaska and Canada. That's in Alaska, winter begins, you know, September 1st, right. and everything freezes. In Colorado, comparatively, we have pretty mild winters. So there is truly really reason for a breeding pair of bald eagles here to migrate far. They may disperse from the breeding territory, which many raptors do and go winter somewhere else, mm -hmm. but then they come back to where the tree is. And 
a tree with leaves and shade that is for breeding and raising kids in you know April, May, June, July is not necessarily going to be the best place to find food and shelter in January or December. So they leave. I'm guessing they don't leave the state. Um. Also, with the population growth, they're currently an endangered species, correct? No, 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 no. The bald eagle, this is actually kind of interesting. The bald eagle being our now bird was declared an endangered species in 1967 prior to actually the ratification of the Endangered Species Act, mm. which, which happened in 1972. They were then reduced in status from in danger to threaten in the summer of 95 and then completely removed from the endangered species list in 2007. Are, according to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, so the species every country worldwide, all the various categories, they are a species of concern. Even though they are only found on one continent, they are doing extremely well. Wow. We've had a wind shift here. <laughs> I think girl. Check out her wingspan, too. Yeah, seven feet. She is a girl. Um, bald eagles do tend to have a slightly narrower and longer wingspan in addition to their body size um then whoa great blue heron come and glow <laughs> look up here yeah <laughs> then golden eagles do uh again as i tell a bald eagle is not just simply a golden eagle with a white head and white tail shape wise morphologically taxonomically lifestyle they are very very different um part of the reason it's sometimes difficult to have a really well behaved an interactive educational ambassador of all the eagle um, with zoos and nature centers is due to their very social and very confident nature if they are truly imprinted like our short-eared owl was um, or is when these guys mature they can turn into face biters oh. and I can see I can't get away from her face so that was another reason I intensively trained for two and a half months I got her to realize that she would never be hungry again, would eat a day, regardless of, um, you know, how, uh, regardless of the temperature, regardless of whether she did something properly or responded to her training. And I wanted her to accept the fact that, let's move the screen back a little, that um, mom close to her was a necessary fact of life. I mean, I don't shove my face up there all the time, I respect her space. It would also send not the good, you know, a, a correct message of the way people should interact with raptors. But it's a safety issue as well. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of training do you do? You know, we've kind of talked about it with each one of your ambassadors. What kind of enrichment activities do you do to keep her uh, engaged? Um, well, I'll start at the beginning. Initially, she just needed to learn to sit on the glove and not be afraid of me and that came you know pretty easy because she did get a little bit of handling when she was in rehab for those first six months um then i taught her to kind of eat a little bit from my hand because we were not going to train her to fly i did not control her weight and she came to us at eight and three pounds she was underweight um just from her circumstances and all from the lack of ability to fly, her pectoral muscles, which are, of course, the breast muscles of her wing, um, they were very atrophy. See there, she's not biting me in aggression. She's just, hey, why are you touching me? Uh -huh. So um, I would feed her a little bit by hand and then let her eat um, the rest on her perch. I trained her to accept my approach without me her jumping on get away from me. And then the touching, lots and lots of touching. just. So she would, when I did it for a necessary reason, like to get her through a doorway or to get her in, it wasn't a dangerous thing. Even though they are social, they're not like Amazons or Macaws. Parents. They don't really enjoy being touched and petted. Really no does. So we don't do that ourselves. Um, 
And then the final thing we do, because as I said, now that she's an adult, she's a little bit sassy. She quickly learned who the folks were who were feeding her on a regular basis. And she would come in and threaten and intimidate. So with gloves and, you know, a couple of tools just to help those folks who aren't sick all and full of muscle, so to speak. Uh -huh. We trained her to wait on a porch until we were done current closure, picking up the leftovers, putting the fresh food on the perch, and then we, she's actually pretty smart. She learned to let us leave, shut the enclosure, we whistle three times, and that is the signal that her space is now hers, and she can go back and eat, and she will not be bothered. And it actually has worked extremely well because we're reinforcing a good behavior rather than punishing a bad one. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, Josette has a, a question for you. Um, is West Nile virus an issue for bald eagles? It is, but I think it's less of an issue for balds than it is for goldens. Golden eagles absolutely seem to be one of those species that are very, very susceptible. I suspect because balds hang out by water so much, they are inundated with mosquitoes and are just naturally res more resistant to arboviruses. An arbos is a virus that is carried by an insect, like West Nile, like malaria. I have heard of bald eagles succumbing to West Nile, being treated from West Nile. I think the fatality and the severity rate of the cases is much, much less mm. than it is with Goldens. Interesting. We actually vaccinated her and all of our other uh, just a couple of days ago on Sunday. Oh, how did that go? Uh, quickly, which is good, 28 birds. Um, fortunately, we didn't increase in the vaccine cost this year, but it still is about $500 to vaccinate all the birds. And um, it's a steep medical cost. So it is interesting, interested in contributing to the cost mm -hmm. of uh, the vaccine, you can go to our webpage and uh, just click on donate. And uh, basically $17, you know, $17.50 per shot mm. for each bird. And we're fortunate that this is the only vaccine right now that we have to apply to our birds. But um, considering it came in from Africa and Asia, in 1999 um the other thing that's now happening is that eastern and equine encephalitis which is really a horse illness eagles and other raptors can catch it wow so yeah always a challenge always something new um as we're kind of you know the reason why we decided to wait and do your bald eagle at this point is obviously to, to pair it with Memorial Day. Um, everyone knows that the nation's bird and kind of mascot is the bald eagle. Can Do you have any understanding of how that got started and why they chose the bald eagle? Yeah, it's very interesting, actually. So we know they're only found in North America, which means when the British first came here in the 1500s, they had seen this eagle before. And bald, spelled B-A-L-D-E at the time, used to mean white-headed. Um, the old name for the American widgeon duck, the drake, is a bald feet and that big white stripe that they that uh, runs up the top of the duck's head. So obviously the bald eagle is not bald, it just has a white head. So um, the entire adoption of the bald eagle as our national symbol is actually wrapped up in the Revolutionary War and the creation of the Great Seal of the United States. So you think about this, this is an eventual seal, any sort of official um, department, U.S. Department of State, defense. It's the bald eagle with the wings outstretched, uplifted, with arrows full of branches in each leg. The bald eagle was adopted because the great seal needed to be created. As a matter of fact, on the same day that the Declaration of Independence signed, July 4th, 1776, the Continental Congress tasked a committee with 
okay, we got to go to Europe and get some people to lend us money to finance this war that we've declared on our colonial master, masters. We need to look like a real country and have a seal so that people know that we are official representatives and our diplomatic documents and treaties. Mm -hmm. So the Congress tasked this committee and the committee was Jefferson Adams and Franklin. Well, it wound up taking three separate committees, six years with a total of 14 different men to come up with what we now know as the Great Seal. All kinds of different designs. Eventually they saw the eagle very late in the process, somewhere I think around 1781 or 1782, they said, no, we want a bald eagle. This is uniquely American. And eagle's right foot so it looks left as you look at it, but it's the eagle's right foot is a cluster of olive branches, which traditionally has olives and 13 leaves for the 13 original colonies. And then in the eagle's left foot is a bundle of 13 arrows. And sometimes, although officially the, the eagle is always supposed to be looking towards the right or the peaceful side, some people have sort of um, unofficially turned the eagle's head so that in times of war it's looking towards the arrows. Ah. Anyway, it's somewhat apocryphal that Ben Franklin stood up and said, no, 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 I want the wild turkey, I don't want the bald eagle. But what is known is that he absolutely did not bald eagles. In a letter to his daughter when Franklin was in, uh, in France, he called the bald eagle a bird of bad moral character because he had watched them fish from the osprey. Whereas wild turkeys, for anybody that's them, as you know, wild turkeys are extremely observant. They're extremely uh, clever and aggressive when they are protecting the, especially when the toms are protecting the females. So Ben went off in all this flowery language about how he is quite certain a male wild turkey would not hesitate to chase a red coat out of the front yard, et cetera, et cetera. So officially it was September of 1782 when the eagle was adopted as our national symbol because it appeared on the great sea. That is amazing. But we were shooting them until 1940. Wow, that is amazing. Um, if anyone yeah. is listening live and has any more questions, um, we can certainly take those. Otherwise, I think that is a perfect way to to end this, unless you have anything else you want to share, Anne. <laughs> no, I just thank you for everybody who's tuning in and watching, especially Dave and Josette for, for, for chiming, providing good commentary. Um, please watch our website for our visit in place and color in place activities. We do hope that we will be opening up for small tours, probably limited to the immediate members of one family next month. And we're still working on the best ways uh, to disinfect things and have good protocols for everybody. Um, obviously, the birds can't wear masks. And sometimes if we wear masks, I've worn a mask around her and she's she just looks at me funny. They don't quite understand what's going. But we appreciate the support as all nonprofits do during these really hard times when all programs have disappeared. And right now we're hoping that she and the rest of our crew will be up at the Dylan Amphitheater for Movies on the Water on Sunday, July 5th. So that's kind of the, the uh, 4th of July weekend. And we'd love for everybody that's got the ability to come up there and see us in person. That sounds amazing. Um, and same goes for the backcountry wilderness area. We're super excited to kind of have the go ahead to safely and slowly open up programs, including Camp Backcountry, which officially will start next Monday. So if you have a, a kid who needs some fresh air and um, adventure this summer, definitely look up campbackcountry.org. Um, otherwise, and I, I just want to thank you so much for, for doing this throughout this stay at home and safer at home orders um, and giving us all kind of an insight to these yeah. awesome raptors. Absolutely. I'm glad we we're able to kind of end these this series, at least for now. Maybe we'll take a little break and find it on a rainy day. But I want everybody able to see her. She's so darn big. 
up close. So I got rid of my little arm stand here. <laughs> Looks like I'm holding a dragon. You can see her tail from behind. Wow. Too. There we go. She's got a little bit of brown on it. July seems to be the month that she changes. Um, I su suspect that when she grows in, she's already started molting her tail. I suspect she is going to grow in mostly snow white feathers this year, but she doesn't drop her entire, entire tail each year. She's definitely one of the stars for our tours. So believe me, it will be a website when we're ready to accept visitors again. And I hope it's very soon. We do too. Well, and thank you everybody out there for listening. Um, we, will you, have, we will have this up on our blog, HRCA backcountryblog.org um, a little later this afternoon, and we will catch up with you soon. Thanks, Anne. All right. Stay safe and healthy, everybody, and enjoy the fresh year, the official start to summer. Yes. See you soon.